Welcome, welcome. We are back with Food for Thought Live. I don't know what number, which is a great sign that we've been doing quite a lot. Um, and you can see, if you've already joined us for some of the previous ones, that this is Food for Thought Live with a little difference, a little twist. In fact, a couple of twists. One, one definite twist and one potential twist. The definite twist is that you can see this is a different backdrop. I'm sitting uh, with my balcony doors open um, for the simple reason that uh, it's beautiful, hot summer weather. Um, very not English and just loving it. Um, I'm not, not complaining at all, but it's way too hot to have the doors shut. And it's even too hot to not be sitting close to the doors. So here I am sitting on the edge uh, by my balcony with a plate of nuts beside me, which for anyone who uh, has has been following any of my social media channels lately, or indeed the last Food for Thought live broadcast with the absolutely wonderful um, Peanut Lamb, CEO of the David Shepherd Wildlife Foundation, uh, we had a little visitor towards the end of our, oh, in fact, look at that right on cue. Look over, look over, this, this couldn't be more, this couldn't be more perfectly timed. It may not be Kiki. Look at, look to the uh, corner of the screen there. <laughs> uh, come on in. If it, so it might not be Kiki. The reason I say that is because uh, Kiki's a squirrel, by the way. For anyone who doesn't know, Kiki's a squirrel, a wild grey squirrel who has been uh, becoming increasingly tame and lovely and visiting me and literally coming into my apartment and uh, and spending time eating, which is just gorgeous. She's my lockdown buddy. Uh, however, there is a... Yeah, that wasn't Kiki. See, there was a, there's another squirrel. In fact, I'm sure there's se several, but... Um, I'm so thrilled about something regarding Kiki, which is that since I've realized that I actually have two visiting, one is still incredibly nervous, and that, that was that one. Haven't even named him or her. I'm thinking him because I think he bullies Kiki a little bit. And I'm not cool with that. Now, I, I didn't, of course, realize this when I, when I started to uh, entertain young Kiki. However, the other day, Kiki was here and the other squirrel arrived and Kiki got well and truly seen to, like seen off. Um, so it made me very, very happy that it's her that I've been pampering, that, I, that I've been giving Whole Foods organic <laughs> mixed nut collection to. She gets to choose. That's why there's a plate of mixed nuts next to me. Um, and uh, I dare say Kiki will make an appearance, Ariana. And uh, and Sharon, you're absolutely right. She has become a little media star. I put a, a little video clip of her coming and uh, sidling up right next to me and eating some nuts, and it and it went it went to a good few thousand people on Twitter. So that's lovely. Now the other twist, which it, it, you may be wondering why I'm talking about Kiki so much. I can see the trees moving behind me. Might just be the wind, but it it could be Kiki. Um, the reason I'm winging it and talking about Kiki a lot is because Lorian isn't yet here. And uh, with the world being the way it is right now in terms of things like uh, internet outages and um, I myself am on Virgin Media, which I, I got that simply because it's the, the fastest, in theory, most reliable, certainly the fastest broadband. It's a fiber connection I've got. Uh, and that went out of service a couple of weeks ago for, a, for an entire half day um nationally so things happen at the moment because of the, the sheer weight of traffic so many people uh, constantly surfing the internet whether it's gaming or playing uh, or watching netflix movies or, or just working from home but there's an awful lot more people online these days so i i as you will have gathered from the title i'm due to be talking to laurie and mclaren from action for rhinos for whom i am very very proud to be a patron um and they are an incredible organization which we will talk about a little bit, but I don't want to steal any of Lorian's thunder. So I'm going to do two things. One is I'm going to wait and we, we're going to chat. We can talk about all kinds of stuff. Um, 
and I w we can talk about rhinos, we can talk about action for rhinos, but I don't want to take Lorian's uh, opportunity to speak to you herself, which I know she'll want, because if this, if, if she's unable to join us tonight, we'll reschedule it, because they're an incredible outfit who you really need to hear from, and their ways, their their methods are unique, um, at least to me. They're, they're, they're very, uh, I think, very forward-thinking uh, in the way that they, they work, in that they're not a charity. Um, hello? Did you, did you guys hear that? I think that's a parakeet, actually. I think there's a parakeet close by. They, they make some f f fairly cool sounds. Anyway, uh, Action for Rhinos are an incredible organization who, who focus very, very heavily on education. They, their aim is to inspire people. And one of the things that, that I think I shared on, on the, the flyer that I made for this, uh, this broadcast was that they say they are not prepared to be the generation that allows 40 million years of evolution to just die out, are you? And I think that's just a really good indication of how direct they are and proactive they are. And we will hear from Lorraine. Either she'll jump on and uh, we'll, we'll bring her into this chat or this will turn into the first Kiki uh, live broadcast on Food for Thought, where we'll just sit around and see if she if she shows up. And we'll talk about anything you guys want to talk about. Hello, Carol Ann from Toronto and Elizabeth from Atlanta. How wonderful is it? And goodness me, Maria from Spain. Look at that. We've got Winnie from Dunbar. We've got people all over the world. So just in that little glance, I'm seeing United States, Canada, Spain and Scotland already uh, i know there's a lot of you from england and that's wonderful um wouldn't surprise me if there were some folks on from south africa uh, given that that's where lorian's from and and also where action for rhinos does most of its work and for the simple reason that that's where the the vast majority of the, the remaining rhino population exists if i'm not mistaken i think it's 90 percent or even more uh, so that you know if you're going to do any any rhino protection work of course it's crucial anywhere but that's where the greatest quantity of rhino are however we will talk we will pick up that conversation um with lorian if and when she arrives and if she doesn't arrive tonight we will reschedule it i promise you that we, you, you will hear from lorian and um what we could also do is to take this opportunity to talk about food for thought because that's something we haven't done. So actually, you know, we this is maybe this is this is fate. Maybe we're supposed to talk about food for thought. So, Giles, my my dear friend Giles Alderson, who's uh, I'm sure watching, uh, and I'll be looking out for comments from him. Uh, he and I are making a film called Food for Thought. So for anyone who's not aware of this, the reason why we've called this Food for Thought Live is because. We're making a documentary called Food for Thought, and it's about the global vegan phenomenon. So what it does is it, is it explores the driving forces behind why we're seeing this phenomenal growth in the plant-based lifestyle choice, which which is no longer a, 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 an if, but, or maybe. It's a fact. It, it's it's way past a fad. Uh, and it's I, I think the simplest way to put it is what was very recently marginalized has become mainstream. You'll all know that from when, if you remember restaurants, Remember them? When you go into restaurants these days, Karen, hi from Johannesburg. We have got people from South Africa. Wonderful to see you. Thank you for being on. Um, when you go into restaurants these days, it's not a case of where it used to be. You'd scan the menu and see if there was anything you could you could get that was vegan. Um, nor is it a case of vegan options being available. It's a case of you're handed a, you're given the option of a, a regular menu or a vegan menu. I. I would hazard a guess that in the not too distant future, we won't even be referring to it as normal or vegan. I think vegan is becoming normal. Things are happening so fast. It's, it is genuinely a phenomenon. And that's exactly what our film explores is what are, what are the driving forces behind that? And, and there's Giles. Hey gang. Um, and, um, we wanted to find out why, why this was happening now, because, you know, I'll tell you from a personal perspective, lucky old me, I went vegan three and a half years ago. I wish it was 48 years ago, but it's, it's, it's three and a half years ago. I went, went vegan and I couldn't have got more lucky 
you know, I hit the jackpot in terms of when I went vegan. By the way, I apologize if you, uh, hopefully you're just, I'm wearing a mic, which hopefully isolates my voice. You're not hearing the traffic outside because there are some fairly loud motorbikes and stuff occasionally. So I hope that's not dis disruptive. Um, so yeah, I couldn't have chosen or I didn't choose it for that reason, of course, but I couldn't have got more lucky in terms of when I went vegan because I just so happened to have gone vegan at the point when it seemed to tip over the edge and everyone's th talking about it, everyone's thinking about it. Every restaurant has vegan options, supermarkets massively increasing their, their vegan options, um, entire vegan sections. And of course, you know, even accidentally vegan food, which is be be getting much more marketed these days um, because they realize that there's a huge demand for vegan food. So uh, Giles and I set out to make food for thought to find out why. And, and in, in simplest terms, really what it comes down to is one of three key drivers. One is the environment. People understand now that meat consumption contributes enormously to uh, CO2 and uh, greenhouse gas emissions and climate change. And I mean enormously. What, one of the statistics people aren't familiar with is the fact that the um, factory farming industry um, contributes more CO2 than the entire transportation sector combined. So just let that land for a second. All the planes, trains, boats, cars, trucks, all of it combined contributes less CO2 emissions than factory farming. A lot of people don't realize that. But th those that do, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's one thing to buy an electric car, and I, and I urge you to do so. But we, we in, in Food for Thought, have an electric car manufacturer who literally says on camera, getting an electric car is fantastic, but you can make a far greater impact just by reducing your meat consumption. So that's the environment side. There's the animal welfare side, of course. Some people, like myself included, do it simply because they reach a point where they think, I can't, I can't justify doing this anymore, especially for any of you guys who know me as someone who speaks for animals and represents charities. Uh, animal charities, you know, I, I, I'm em embarrassed and ashamed to admit that when I started doing that uh, five, six years ago, seven years ago, I was I was still eating meat. And that wasn't regarded as a, a problem. And no one gave me a hard time over that. But I'm giving myself a hard time. And if any of you guys tuned into my conversation with the, the absolutely wonderful friend and actor and animal hero Peter Egan you'll have heard him say a similar thing um, just the inability to recognize who you were before you made the change and that's where I got to very very rapidly uh, and actually Giles was the, the final tipping point Giles I went vegetarian for about a about a month literally about a month and Giles and I met so at some point during that month and he said you know you're gonna have to go vegan next don't you and I was like oh but I go to the gym and I did that cliche thing of thinking, yeah, that, that's not, that's not cool. I can't, I can't possibly go that far. It's extreme. I was that guy. And um, and then it just happened, and it was the best thing I ever did. So that was the animal side, with help from Giles. And um, and then uh, finally, it's the um, personal health, of course. And 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 probably, even though I've saved that till last, it's arguably probably the the biggest factor of all because people being people you know what's in it for me kind of attitude and that's what that's what tends to drive people to take action is when they'll benefit when when their health will be improved um and and i and i get that and that's fine and set, and, and you know frankly we'll take it whatever whatever gets people there it's a win um but that's what the film the film explores is is those driving forces the environment the animal welfare and our personal health and uh, we're in the process of making this film and we still are, in fact, in the process of making this film. Some of you guys very kindly contributed to our crowdfunder, uh, which to my utter astonishment was over a year ago. Can you believe that, Giles? Um, thank you there. Giles has just commented. In you, where you guys are commenting, you'll see that Giles has just um, put uh, the web address up for more information on the documentary. And you, you may also have tuned in a couple of weeks ago when I in interviewed uh, Louis Sahoyas, who was the director of the incredible new vegan documentary The Game Changers and he's also the Oscar winning director of The Cove which was the unbelievably heartbreaking harrowing but brilliant account of the Taiji dolphin slaughter in Japan um, which put uh, Rico Barry on the map 
uh, with the Dolphin Project and everything else. So we were due to go to uh, Los Angeles and then up, drive up to San Francisco to see, or just outside of San Francisco where Louis lives, to interview him for our film because you know, as, as a part of exploring the driving forces, of course, it makes perfect sense for us to understand why does an Oscar winning filmmaker, he won the Oscar for the COVID in 2010. When you win an Oscar, you can pretty much do what you want uh, in terms of filmmaking, you, you, you get to choose. So our question to him very simply was, well, wh why now? Why, wh what made you choose to do a vegan based documentary now when you could do anything you want? And of course he's doing other things too, but uh, we were all set to have that conversation and literally um, I think it was two, three weeks before we were due to fly, the, the lockdown was imposed. And of course, California was was almost as, in, in fact, I think they were ahead of the UK, they, but they were certainly as stringent as us in terms of the lockdown. And guess what, folks? I see her. Hey. Hello. How are you doing? I'm so well. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Don't um, don't worry. I, we were just talking about the documentary, and I and I said that you would you'd be on your way, and here you are. So take a take some Thank take you. a swig of sparkling water. Lor Everyone, this is Laurie and McLaren from Action for Rhinos. But listen, just re just relax. Yeah. We're just sitting here. Everything's lecker. Everything's lecker. Lecker. And, <laughs> and also, we we're, we're we're hoping for an appearance from Kiki, which is why I've got the plate of nuts next oh. to me. I am yeah. so excited. And Dan, let me just say thank you so much for inviting me to chat to you. I'm oh so excited. It's a and pleasure. I'm humbled and honored to have been asked. So thank you. Oh, goodness me. Hey, we're, we're humbled and honored to have you. And I was just talking about the, the I, I, I specifically said I didn't want to steal your thunder. Um, so I didn't go into too much detail, but I was just describing what an absolutely unbelievably wonderful organization Action for Rhinos is and how proud I am to be a patron for you. But I didn't want to talk about it because I don't want to steal your thunder because I, I wouldn't, I'd love for you to introduce the, the concept to everyone else. But, but, I, but look, this is so wonderful. We have got people. So normally, guys, what I, what I would, would do is I would, be, I, I would have um, prepped my guest to tell them these things before, but this is now, we're gonna throw Laurie in a little surprise. On the right hand side of your screen, you'll see a comments button and you'll see that there's 73 comments already of people. We have people from South Africa, unsurprisingly. We have people from Spain, Scotland, US, Canada, all over the world and it's just so wonderful. And, uh, and welcome to you. Thank you. I may just keep lacing here handy. I have, <laughs> I have a terrible habit of talking with my hands all the time, and um, it gets a little bit, I, I get a little bit excited, especially when I go into schools and I start talking. And I've had my kids come and watch some of my talks, and they go, Mom, your hands were flying around. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to keep Lacey here. Lacey was... Um, was given to me by Raising Rhino Rands and um, Love it. Bless Tanya down in Cape Town. She made her in this beautiful, if you can see, lace design material. Yeah. Just. Oh, it's gorgeous. beautiful. And um, yes, Raising Rhino Rands, one Love of the it. organizations that um, used the education program and handed over when handing over one of these rhinos and um, charities they support are local charities down in Cape Town, uh, right. the for Wild, orf the Rhino Orphanage. So all proceeds go to wonderful charities. Let's see, the, the, now this is one of the wonderful things about you guys and your very, very, I. I'm sure, I don't know if it's right to say it's unique, but certainly to me and, 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 and with, with my experience, you, you work in a really unique way and in a very deliberate, proactive way. And, and I, one of the words that I could use to describe what you guys do is collaborative. You're so collaborative. It's all about partnerships. It's all about Absolutely. organizations that are already up and running and doing the thing. And you, can you talk a little bit about how, how you're 
your business model works and how it evolved, to, uh, how you came to, to set it up in that way? Because I think it's fascinating and brilliant. Uh, thank, thank you, Dan. Uh, very, very kind of you. And it, it is a collaboration. The only way this is ever going to work is if there's amalgamation of all organisations where they can actually be able to switch information, help <laughs> one another to actually get this crisis under control, trying to hold on to something small um, and, and protect it is not going to solve the problem. So we love collaborating with people and amalgamating and just being able to, to help and see the hands again uh, any way we can. <laughs> Do you have any Italian blood? It must, it must be, it must That's be. It it Scottish blood, the Scottish blood. <laughs> Um, carry on. And, um, I think the best way to to start or to get to action for rhinos is to just give you a little, maybe a little inkling into why I am so passionate about rhinos. Yes, please. And um, it, it actually all began when I worked at the Honest to Put Veterinary Institution in South Africa, in Pretoria, north of Pretoria. Um, and it's a teaching facility for all your, 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 your vets. Uh, at one point, it was the only teaching facility in the Southern Hemisphere. So we got, you know, hordes of students from around the world studying there. Phen right. Phenomenal facilities. Um, and I was working in the equine clinic, obviously being horse, being large animals. And at that stage, they didn't have a wildlife clinic. So any large animals came through us um, and oh, in my eight years there, worked on buffalo, worked on tapers, removed the tooth of an elephant um, oh. going, through, going through the large animal theatre. Right. And we were called up saying um, a game ranger had noticed a, a rhino heifer. She must have been about two and a half years old and she needed... Um, to be checked out because she kept on falling over, running into the bush, and they darted her and they found she had cataracts. Um, and the specialists, Dr. Goodhead and Dr. Fenton, they are ophthalmologists. They actually were going to set up a cataract removal. Anyway, it was my job to make sure she was happy and comfortable in her home. She arrived. I had to make a board for her, like I did all the equines, all the horses. So you'd give the name, the breed, a description, the owner. So I had to name this, this rhino that had arrived and I named her Bubbles. No, can't, can't be sure why, where Bubbles came from, but Bubbles, <laughs> the rhino, arrived in our clinic. She had been sedated um, post-operatively. She, she was in great health. She went into theatre the cataracts were removed and she was, you know, back back in her home, back in her stable. Um, the next morning I came, I think I was one of the first in the clinic and I looked in and I saw, you know, her eyes had been covered and patched, cotton wool in the nose for, you know, keep the sensories down and the water drop over. And I thought, all right, well, let me just slide the bolt put my hand in and turn the water trough over to, to fill it for, for bubbles. Uh, she was sleeping very peacefully, facing, so if you can imagine, she was sleeping facing that way. And I was pretty much over here. Um, I leaned over and before my fingers could close on the trough, she had stood up and turned around and I froze because this massive animal had moved in a split second and obviously head up snorting. Um, I just retracted, we we'd work on the water bucket at a later stage. Um, and then what had happened with, you know, obviously lots of students and people come to see the rhino and the treatments, she ended up actually charging and knocking her horn off under one of the wow. automatic water drinkers. And so I had a, a rhino horn in my office. 
just there and I studied it and I found it so interesting. And, and where it had snapped off at the growth plate, um, she, she was very sheepish about it, but there was nothing wrong. It was as if someone had ripped a nail out, you know, slammed your nail in the door. Um, she was then sent home with, 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 with her horn. Uh, they, they treated a little bit of um, iodine on the actual growth plate on the, on the wounded area. And I stayed in touch with the game ranger. And within two years, that horn had grown back to its original glory. And that was my, my first talk going, these guys are such amazing creatures, such iconic creatures. But nothing's been studied of them. Their anatomy physiology right. actually follows that of an equine, strange right. enough. Um, so, yes, that was my first, and that was, oh, sure, but 19 years ago. So that's how it all started. So it's really interesting to, because this the, the, the whole equine connection, and it's, I know we're going to talk a little later about our... our um, our mutual friend and colleague Johan Murray. Um, and I've had the conversation with him about the fact that, as you've just described, there's so little known about the physiology and anatomy of a rhino that the cl and the closest thing, which comes as a great surprise to a lot of people, is a horse. Hence, the equine, uh, as you say, the, the your and your so that's where your love of rhinos was born. Was that was that? Yes, that, that's incredible. Yes, yeah, so these iconic creatures, which are prehistoric almost, um, you know, if, if you go back to the extinctions that, that have happened, they were, oh, hello, Kiki. <laughs> she wants to meet Lacey. <laughs> um, yeah, this, this, that might well be Kiki, that's her spot, but you carry on and she'll come and grab yeah. some nuts and we'll... Uh, We'll, we'll probably get a little bit. If it's not her, we'll get a visit from her at some point for sure. Oh, fantastic. So, yes, um, not enough research. You, you couldn't go to any library and get, you know, encyclopedia references to the uh, anatomy of a rhino, where, where nerves end, what what drugs to be used. Right. Um, so, you know, my, How much my next step to use. Exactly. So then my next step actually in in the whole rhino world was um, my association with colleagues that had gone and worked with Dr. William Folds and assisted in the, you know, the recovery of Tandy um, down in the Eastern Cape. Right. And um, there was a huge, there was a huge cry for something to be done. Uh, to to do it, and um, I had actually been um, at Honest to Put at the time, and I'd spoken with Johan, and I said, "How can I help? I I'd like to help. I, I know I can." And he went and he handed out over basically the information he had. He went, "Make something of it," wow. and so basically, saving the survivors that was there. I just took to the next level. I opened up a NGO, a BPO, I started, you know, putting it onto different media platforms and, and trying to get attention. And with that, uh, you start making connections to wonderful, amazing people uh, uh, like uh, Dean Root at HESC and um, Petronal at Care for Wild. And, and you, you, it opens up doors to so many people trying so many things. But yeah. back in 2014, when, when I'd started, the um, poaching was escalating to a, a an insane record. And, um, you know, I, I think also there was a hype where people were turning going, someone do something about it. Right. Instead of, you know, having these, these, these rhinos which have been um, poached and then obviously put down, let's see what we can do. How can we... How can we assist? Um, and that's where the vets were phenomenal. They went into researching, um, but you know you can't get a handful of rhinos and start testing a, a penicillin on them. And right. how? Yeah. Oh. So the amount of work and research that went in um, in the early times was unbelievable. And what was found was unbelievable. The amount of nerves 
in a rhino's face is phenomenal in its in its um you know and, and having five different species of rhino now too yeah. how how would you treat the black rhino opposed to the the white rhino as the javan so still lots to learn um but yeah. i've got a an extremely wonderful um lady suzanne rudman to assist me in in the organization and she honestly could do a job of 10 people um and we we started growing and then on the 15th of may 2015 we got the call of this runner that had been poached down in the eastern cape and we saw the photo and your your first reaction was was gasp you it it, it, it yeah. looked like a um someone had literally dropped a dynamite on this animal's face and it had exploded it was and we and the vets went well let's give it a go dr folds down in the eastern cape went i'll support let's 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 get going and that was hope that was hope and for anyone please please explain a little bit about hope because for for, for anyone who doesn't know the story of hope I think the story is just incredible, and your your involvement in it is so so uh, significant. And uh, and and hope. I think that you, if I'm not mistaken, the fo one of the photographs you sent me, which I'm going to share. Um, I'll, but before I do, it, it, is that hope that you sent me the photograph of in the when you when we um, the the rhino who that had been poached with the exposed sinus yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So I'm going to share a photograph of Hope right now, and I want and Lorian's going to tell you the story. Um, but and before I share this, but everyone who knows me knows I don't share graphic content, and this this is actually Hope standing up. So it's you know she's she's alive and alert and standing up, but I do want want to pre warn you that it's pretty shocking. But it's what Lorian's referring to right now. Uh, so it's, I think it's important to share it. And I think it's important for a couple of reasons. And just, just before you get back to the story about hope, this is, this is where Lorian talks about Dr. Will Folds and where we talk about saving the survivors and Johan Marais. This is what they're treating. This is what they're dealing with. This is why, for example, saving the survivors is called saving the survivors. That's that's why because this is what they're dealing with. So, Lorian, please carry on, and I'll I'll share a photograph. And I just wanted to let the sensitive among you know that this is coming because it may be a little bit alarming or uh, jarring for you. Yes, it, it is. It, it is horrendous. So, uh, you know, you can't you can't apologize because that looks actually fantastic. Right. What it this did. Look a, like. Yeah. This this is yeah. this is great, and this there she is on her feet looking at the camera. Yes, um, um, but she was a, a, a rhino which had a soul that looked through you. Um, being in the in the equine world, um, the movie Sea Biscuits comes to mind, where um, this horse they were looking for a racehorse, and the guy said the horse looked through him, and that's that's what hope. Did. She she really did look through you. She she had this power in her, which um, which was incredible. And you know, coming back to um, the the wonderful Dr. Herod actually said, you, you shouldn't name you shouldn't name the animals. Don't name them. And we said we, we have to name. And Susanna said, you know, let's give her a bold, great. African name, and um, I'd read somewhere, and I went, "No, let's let's call her Hope, because it almost stands for Hold On, Pain Ends, H O P E, and and it wasn't just for her; it was for for the rhinoceroses going through this this crisis. How you know? And um, another thing that Mandela Nelson Mandela had said is. Hope is a powerful weapon, and no no number one power on earth can deprive you of it. So it it, it was a great name to give Amazing. her, and um, yes, things started, and that was back in May, twenty fifteen, 
And um, with us being on the, the, the media side, if I could call it like that, what yeah. we would do is we would show people, um, we could show them transparency, accountability for their donations, showing them that everything that was happening with hope um, had a cost to it. So donations were so important, but we broke it down. We, we showed them, you know, the cost of the penicillin we were using, the plates we were using, the, it, all those things. And, you know, it was huge costs, but we had to do it. And, you know, we had a, a lot of um, head to head with organizations saying that, you know, is it worth it? Is it worth it? And, and we, we said, it has to be. It has to be worth it. We 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 have to do this, and we got a fantastic response. Um, and we, as I said, showed them procedures as she grew. And the picture you showed was when she was looking at one of her, one, you know, one right. of her great moments because yeah. obviously all those sinuses are exposed. Yeah. And um, then the vets were were trying to find new ways, innovative ways. And uh, they came up with using um, hides of other animals to protect the nasal passages um, because they were, you know, first using um, plates, which you would drill into the bone, right. but they would fragment. So <laughs> it was very difficult to keep the shields on. And a rhino's natural instinct is to sharpen that horn that they have. So the you know the plates even were fantastic. They did come off quite easily when she got to a, a, a scratching pole. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was again. I was uh, I'm fortunate. Well, I don't know. Fortunate doesn't even feel like the right word. It's a, it's an honour and a privilege to to witness those sorts of procedures happening. And I did have that opportunity uh, when I was in South Africa. Uh, with Margot Raggett, who will, uh, as many of you know, and who will also be a guest uh, in the coming weeks, and um, she and I went with Saving the Survivors to to see uh, an operation take place on a rhino that had been left in exactly this kind of state that we've just seen that, that Hope was left in. So, it's it's, I th you know, you're quite right in saying that, that you, or you you are. You, highlighted the fact that people say is this is this justifiable is it worth it you know the costs and the and it's, and it's the, the one life and what i am so eternally grateful to you for and those involved in 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 saving these incredible animals is is precisely that is that every single one of them matters and not because of the numbers being low but because as you described this is a this is a being with a soul and she looks right into your soul and when you're in the presence of a rhino you kind of know that in no uncertain terms and and it's quite an astonishing profound experience isn't it to be in the presence of a rhino and i know you've spent an, an awful lot of time in in presence of rhinos but but it never wears thin does it Abs uh, no, absolutely absolutely and you know I, i'd love to just the last time i actually saw you dave um listen to me dan was <laughs> when we went to go and see strip yeah i was about to about to say yeah 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 uh, and, and Susan Scott, yeah. and yeah. I mean, that too was a phenomenal um, film that they put together, a documentary that I, I, I do encourage so many people to to watch. Abs absolutely, and it's I was uh, I was just sharing not so long ago, not not so many weeks ago, a link. Uh, in, uh, during this this uh, lockdown that we're all in, they've they've actually made that film available in various places in the world for a sec second run, um, including the UK. So we will find that. I'm sure that we'll find that while we're on this. And if Giles doesn't, I'll have a look myself. Um, and we'll put a link to where you can see Stroop. It's it, am I pronouncing it correctly? Stroop. So like lecker. Lecker. It's called Stroop. It's right. Means to in, in Afrikaans, it means to be. Pulled raw, right? To expose the the rawness of it. Stir right. Up. Right. So I'll let you say it, but it's pronounced. It's spelled S T R O O P for those of you who who want to look it up, and we'll we'll tr try and find the link for you. And as Lorian says, please please do watch it. It's an incredible 
film. By the way, before we before we move on on that very subject, Alison has asked, "Is there a book out about Hope?" I don't know. Do you happen to know if there's a book about her? You don't know. There is no book about her. There should be. I think that might be your next job. It's, you know, I think I, th I think that's a wonderful, wonderful idea. Yes. There you go. Thank you, Alison. You may have just created a book. I've got a, I've got a framed picture. I'm going to go find of hope that I keep. Do. In my next room. Yeah, yeah, go. Yes, of course. So while while Lorian does that, I also want to just say to you, um, you know, and I, I, again, that I think that photograph is important for people to see, as 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 brutal and harrowing as it is, she's alive, and I, I wouldn't just show it to you gratuitously, and for no need. But one of the th one of the things I wanted to to illustrate was just what these incredible heroes are up against, and that's that's the kind of thing they're up against. The other thing I wanted to tell you about it is that when I had the honour of of witnessing this uh, procedure uh, with, by the way, Dr. Johan Mare, who is uh, from Saving the Survivors, he also has agreed to be a guest on, on this broadcast. So we'll be hearing from him directly. So I won't go into too much detail and steal his thunder either. However, um, what I can tell you is that when I was there witnessing a sedated rhino being sutured, or stitched, and actually what they they had come to using by this point was it was elephant skin now only skin from elephants that had died naturally and um, which which of course is the only right way to do it um but of course it makes perfect sense because when you're talking about an animal that needs the resilience of a rhino uh, an elephant has that too and what i found utterly astonishing was the fact that under sedation there every single time the needle went in to stitch the the uh, covering on to the wound, there was a, a flinch every single time, and that's sedated. So I think it just, uh, it kind of underlines what Lorian was saying about just how sent how many nerves there are in the face of a rhino, and that th to such an extent that they're even feeling pain and being jarred by the procedure under sedation. So you went you you've got a. A lot more experience with these sorts of things than me, but it's uh, it's just my my uh, some thoughts from when I was out in the field with saving the survivors and it and just how how uh, it's it's hard to it's hard to put into words actually. Yes, absolutely. But I, I have this framed picture. Um, the photographer was Adrian Stern. He's a fantastic photographer, and mm. it took, I, I think many people have seen it. Go oh, over that. Yeah, there you go. That one, oh, look at that. Good Lord. And there she is, magnificent, with her plate that she has on. It's incredible. Good. Just incredible. incredible. It really is incredible. And it's such a, you know, it's sometimes, I mean, I've, again, any, anyone who knows Johan Mare and has seen him speak um, or been privileged enough to spend time with him in the, in the field knows this is a man who, he feels it deeply himself. He feels it, you know, when he loses one. And he's very, he wears his heart on his sleeve in that regard as well, which I admire deeply about him. Um, so, you know, it's, it's quite, so tell us what, what happened next with Hope, because the story goes on. I think it's, uh, by the way, before you do, it's such a beautiful name. I completely uh, adore the name and the, and the, and the meaning, the meaningfulness behind it, not just the word, but the initials, as you said, I think that's incredible. But how did the story progress from there where she's uh, it, undergone treatment? Then there was such a huge, uh, oh, uh, the word explosion is not the right word, but the people woke up, the press woke up, the, the, we, the film crews were coming down. There was such a huge wake up call. Right. That Estia at the time was inundated with calls of other poached rhinos um, to be treated. You know, sometimes the rhino hasn't had its horn hacked off, so it's not poached, but it's been shot. The amount of bullet wounds that had to be treated. Mm -hmm. And again, um, you don't know how deep it's going, how much pathology has been done on 
the shoulder, the upper leg, how to treat it, how to, yeah. how, to keep yeah. the, how, how do you keep a rhino still, a two-ton animal right. in, just, in in a boma, it sends their stress levels out of control. And they're so, very sensitive. They're very sensitive animals, aren't they? I mean, it, it, it's 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 really dangerous. Not just be, not, and, I, and I mean for them, not not for the people working with them. No. It, even though that's true too, it's incredibly dangerous for the rhino. Absolutely, and and every procedure is dangerous. Um, Absolutely. And and what they were finding with Hope is her um, her sensitivity to being anesthetized was was also changing right. and we had to be very careful with with making sure she can only be down for a certain amount of time um right. what treatment needed to be get, done so they would go in do what they could and then you know you needed to step away and she needed to carry through and she did and she was then moved from the ph phenomenal team of <laughs> William Foltz down in Eastern Cape. She was, she was moved actually up to very close to Ornestapuit, the veterinary f facility, right. um, where it, it was just easier to be able to, you know, do work on her and treat her as regularly as, as could be. Um, and at that stage, there was, again, like I was saying, so much else going on right that um you were learning on on a daily basis new things um the the, the team with the fantastic zoe gilfus she's just also a phenomenal vet i believe you met her too zoe yes yes um, in incredible works closely with johan and in, in, in saving the survivors and and it, both heroes absolutely yeah, she yeah she did, and um, they went across to treat a, a Sumatran rhino. That's right. how the power of media had had had, had built this organisation. Right. Um, so it, it it was incredible, and obviously, also getting connected with the amount of rhinos which are being poached. There was a lot of orphans that are which were being left. And the orphans also needed to be treated, and we learnt the f wonderful, wonderful, wonderful places where the rhinos, the, you know, the orphans were um, being treated and looked after. And I, I, I can't speak highly enough about so many people that that are involved, you know, in, in rhino conservation, right? And how much they're working, and you just don't see it. Uh, absolutely, and I'm, I want to share a photograph with you guys. This is. This is something Lorian just mentioned about um, the rhinos not always po poached. They're not successful. Often the poachers will will shoot the rhino or you know poison the rhino, but not be successful in removing the horn. Um, and in this particular photograph, where you will see on the left there, that is Johan Marey, who I'm with, um, and this rhino that he was treating. That's actually an X-ray, a portable X-ray machine that he's holding there. That rhino was shot in the front shoulder um, in, an, in an attempted poaching. In tr and tragically, uh, this, the, the f this is the male, the female, uh, the, the, they were a pair, was poached and died. Um, and this, so this fellow was left with a gunshot wound. And the extent of it, and, and this, this is, I think, at this point in the photo here, we're, we're looking at, I think it's about, through at least four or five days after it happened so it's, i'm not talking about death from the gunshot wound but the fact that it had prevented that rhino from using one of its forelegs was a death sentence meaning it would have had to be put to sleep the, the so the, the the risks associated with the rhino being shot so if you're a if you're a, we, we've all seen rescue dogs that that have not even sometimes not one leg but sometimes losing two legs and adapting Rhinos simply do, do not have that. That they haven't got that luxury. The weight that they are, they need all four legs in order to defend themselves in the environment that they live in. They need all four legs. They absolutely would would be be a, a death sentence if they didn't have use of all four legs. So Johan, there, and and I'm happy to tell you, did successfully save that one. That wasn't a poaching. That's just as Lorian was talking about. Is that was a a, a gunshot, that, and and it was almost as much of a. Um, a potential fatality to the rhino 
as uh, as as poaching would be. Yes, and again, um, it's it's a risk every time you're putting the rhino under any form of anaesthetic. Yeah, absolutely. Um, especially your 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 bullet wounds to the limbs. Um, the yeah. rhino would, with the weight get up and you could risk the, a second fracture. Um, and it, Absolutely. It's, it is heart-wrenching to see these animals in pain, these massive, magnificent, iconic animals in pain. And when okay. we think of, I think, I think the, the, there's a, because you're right, they're, ma they're massive and they're, they're you know, like a modern day dinosaur. And I think people, there's a misconception. I think people think of them as being this incredibly, I mean, they are absolutely right that they're an incredibly powerful animal, but they're like a, they're, they're timid. They're shy. They're like a cow. They're very, very timid. And, and it's, it's all the more endearing and heartwarming when you realize that that's what they're like. And therefore all the more heartbreaking and heart wrenching, as you say, when, when we lose one, because these are very vulnerable, fragile animals, even though they're the size of a transit van with a couple of horns on their face. It's, they are, as and as you quite rightly said, on top of all of that, they're immensely ancient, powerful souls that you get this sense of just being in their presence, like the like the <laughs> like the example behind me. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I it's hard to impress upon people who because of course I don't want anyone to go and see a rhinoceros in a zoo because that's the last place you should ever be seeing one, and and unfortunately, the only reason that I've ever come into proximity with, with rhino is in the aftermath of a, of a, of a poaching attempt or in the case of Sudan, who, you know, had to be under 24 hour armed guard for the remainder of his life because he was the last male of his kind, the Northern white. And so, but, but if, and when you do have the, the opportunity to, to be in close proximity to a rhino, it's like, it's, the, it's like an elephant. In the, in the sense that it just takes your breath away and it leaves you speechless. And in my case, just makes me sob like a child. It, 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 well said, Dan. It takes your breath away. And then to have worked with the orphans and how they are like a puppy. They are, they, they have their own character. They are right. kind. They are so loving. Um, so loving. And you know, you, you wouldn't say that's a rhinoceros. You'd go, that, that's a Labrador puppy. <laughs> there's, there's, there's such such gentle, such a gentle quality to them and a real beauty. One of the things that I found really lovely about rhino is that you'll see them, they, they sort of lie off, they like kind of lean over to the side, propped up on one. Uh, of course, Lauren, you'll know this very well. And, and for, for, the, for the benefit of any of you guys, You'll see when rhino are together, they'll lie almost like the hands of a clock facing in different directions. Their eyesight's pretty appalling. Their hearing is very good and their sense of smell is good. And so they they have each of them facing out in different directions. And it's the cutest thing to see. So they're all kind of like propped up, leaning to the side, resting, but keeping keeping their ears on the on the horizon in different directions to look after each other. And it's it's beautiful. It's really beautiful. Yes. Uh, they are they are very special animals that really do need assistance with, and that brings me to the next thing was um, I moved to the UK and right. I, I felt even though I was working on the social media platforms, I, I needed to do more, and I then met Jane Ackott and uh, we put action for rhinos together but it's 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 jane that's the the brains and the whiz behind the tech um she's she's fantastic and it you know everyone goes it's education it's awareness we need to teach the children but when teach uh, when children get taught something that they aren't engaging in and they've got nothing to relate it to it's lovely and kind, but then you move you move on to the next thing. And we just wanted to 
show the children that there's just so much more to rhinos, their, their habitat, the, the different species, um, and grow with them. So that's why with Action for Rhinos, we have these modules, and you can follow the modules and, and right. gain more, more knowledge. And from that, um, we can move into the nasty side of the poaching. But for now, you want to always have right. people see these iconic creatures and want to help them. Um, and I, I would love children at schools to, you know, have the opportunity to think of maybe going into paleontology or, um, you know, various zoologies, uh, which they can study later. And that can bring in learning more about the various rhino species. Just I just I... muted my microphone there because there was a siren as well as everything else. There was a, a police car going by or something. So I've just shared up the rhino education project, which is, the, again, it's, I'm, I'm so glad you you started to, to, uh, to talk about the education piece because that's, I guess, at the at the forefront of what Action for Rhinos stands for and does, isn't it? Yes. Yes, absolutely, is to just get awareness and, and, and share. And we've had such wonderful um, reaction, you know, globally, and especially in Vietnam, your your schools in the, in the East, where unfortunately most of the horn is being marketed at. Mm -hmm. um, and you, it's it's so wonderful getting photographs from those schools and putting them in our gallery, um, showing that the, the, you know there is something going on. That people are starting to wake up. That even though it's it's a beautiful bracelet you're wearing on your arm, where does it come from? How was it made? Right. It, it it needs. Things people need to stop and, 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 and consider where things are made, how they're made, um, before thinking of it as a um, uh, something of wealth. Or Absolutely. And I think power. one of the key, really key, yeah, you're right, because it's a it's a it's a challenge that pe that I think it's really important people understand the, the magnitude of, because for a lot of us, especially especially us in the you know in the world of social media where as you all know that the way the algorithms work ensure that we live in a bubble that's that's entirely populated with people who think much like us and they sh share information about the same issues we all know about and it's hard to imagine people not realizing the impact that things like ivory or rhino horn trade is having on these animals but people genuinely don't know and as you've just talked about vietnam and you know the same could be said for china in terms of uh, use of ivory um you do often find that when efforts are made to educate especially to younger generations there's no interest whatsoever in contributing to this kind of cruelty people genuinely don't know as obvious as it may seem to us they don't know absolutely that, absolutely and it, it's it's that awareness and it must be that aha moment and a, a, another i do like my my quotes is um from from Mahatma gandhi uh, he says you must be the change you wish to see in the world it's one awesome. of my very one of my absolute favorite favorite in fact se several of his are in my my list of favorites and you know you and you guys epitomize that so you are and you you are i love the fact that you you make a statement in your in your mission statement if you like there is a a very matter of fact you know we don't want to just make a difference we want to be the difference i think yeah. that speaks volumes about your att attitude towards it and and um oh look we have a visitor i think er, hello <laughs> Oh God! Oh, she doesn't. She didn't, didn't like being on TV. She, oh, oh, back again. Yeah. Here, look. Oh. I'm trying to give you a full view. There she is. Thanks for coming, Kiki. Hi Everyone's guys. Happy to see you. Oh, oh. So it's eight o'clock. So what you can hear now, 
Okay. Let's join everyone. Please don't miss the clap for us. Clapping the NHS. You might be here outside. Clapping the NHS. Thank you, NHS emergency workers. You are heroes on a very different front line, but heroes nonetheless. Uh, of course, it's wonderful right now when it's live, but anyone watching will be like, what was that? <laughs> for anyone who's not aware, which I'm sure the whole planet is, but what happens every Thursday at eight in the case of the UK is that we all come outside of our houses. Um, I don't know if I'll be able to show you even a little bit of what's happening out here. No, we can't see anything. Um, and we're clapping, clapping the NHS for all of the incredible work they're doing during the pandemic. And um, it's rather lovely. And this is about, we're about, I guess, about six or seven weeks in now, and it's just as enthusiastic every time. So I apologize for to, to anyone who, and also the horns. They, it's lovely when the cars go past, they all join in with beeping their horns. Because um, I know that the, the clapping is important to people. So please feel free to do that if you, uh, if you want to. Don't, uh, don't miss it for our sake. Um, sorry for that interruption, but a very, very worthy one. Absolutely. Uh, it's, it, again, I think also this, this pandemic, the friendliness of people, the, the way in people are engaging and, and wanting yeah. to learn things have, has, has been wonderful. And yeah. um, I think I sent you the um, Color, Color Me Rhino, and that's also with uh, Raising Rhino Rand in the Western right. Cape. And they had such a fantastic show of, of, of talented artists from three years old through to 83 years old, coloring in these these rhinos. And with it, just, you know, awareness, sharing, and it was fantastic. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, now, while we're on the t subject of education, what, what I'm going to show, I'm going to share. I don't know if, you're, if my... I'm sure you're hearing this. I don't know if my mic is is directional enough to stop you from hearing it, but it's it's lovely. Cars are going past, just honking their horns and stuff. <laughs> but what what I wanted to share is the um, the downloads page of your website because obviously that's another place where people can get involved. And now we always talk about the importance. Uh, on this broadcast, or of of us all staying proactive. Hi, Kiki. Um, Kiki, see the downloads. Yeah, she's chilled now. <laughs> she, she wasn't sure what was going on with the cameras, but um, the downloads. Yes, absolutely. So I'm going to share with you guys um, the uh, one of the the pages from the Action for Rhinos website uh, that you can find at actionforrhinos.com. Unsurprisingly. And uh, Giles has, I believe, put the, uh, the the link up as well as, by the way, the Raising Rhino Rands that uh, Lorraine's been talking about. So you'll find a link that Giles has added to the comments um, to the Facebook page for Raising Rhino Rands. And what we're looking at now is something that's really important for all of you guys to know about, because I know all of you will be asking, how can we help? And and Lorraine, you know, in the, in our previous uh, broadcasts, I've always I've always acknowledge the, the reality of the world we live in right now as we've just been reminded that you know a lot of people are out of work a lot of people are furloughed a lot of people are concerned about money or just simply not earning money and therefore we're not in a position necessarily to contribute the way we normally would to these causes so the question is what can you do well action for rhinos have made that uh, somewhat easier for us um and here's a couple of examples so what lauren can you talk talk me through what we're seeing on screen here uh, well, they are uh, basically the downloads, free resources, um, and there are two written letters that can be sent straight to CITES, CITES reps and auction houses when people um, see them selling anything, you know, be it ivory, rhino, uh, a foot of a, a, a monkey, um, uh, but, you know, specifically rhino horn specimens. Um, and I think it's important to mention, as it means people who may not, 
you know, be too clued up uh, about the crisis, can quickly download and send without prior knowledge um, or, or needing to know too much, um, you know, if we could ask these people to forward on the response and, you know, what they've seen and, you know, we'll receive it and we can pass on information to the to the right places. Um, it's frightening how even having a, a, a you know, an organisation such as Action for Rhinos will we'll find strange messages going, um, I've got a rhino horn, where can I sell it? And it's it's... You don't quite know if people are baiting you what they're doing, but CITES, there are people that will look into it and um, will investigate things which which needs to be done. You know, even um, going to these antique shows and, you know, seeing these places where, yes, they are old and they are pre let's say 1960s but to to see someone still wanting to sell a ivory bracelet is, right. is wrong and no. you know i think it's important for people to actually look at the seller and go look not acceptable anymore right that kind of right. thing should not be out here um yeah. I know that, the, you know, there is a large push, but I, I, I still see it. You do still see it. And then they'll say, no, yeah. but pre-60s, but yeah. it doesn't matter. That doesn't mean it should be brought to light. No, I I, I couldn't agree more. And I, I, I'm really glad about the fact that this, you know, we're not, this isn't a BBC and we don't have to remain impartial for the sake of the license payer. We can say, it's unacceptable, and and it is. And I know that no one on this broadcast is going to be uh, guilty of that kind of uh, that kind of th thought, even that it's okay to sell rhino horn or or ivory because it's old. Um, you know, quite apart from the the moral and conscious issue that that for me just raises instantly. Well, I think what a lot of people don't understand, and we've just seen this clearly in the in the ivory trade where we know that any trade whatsoever in this case in the uk we were fighting the antiques trade perpetuates an illegal trade so any in inverted commas legal trade enables an illegal trade it enables it, for example in the case of antique ivory it, it enables people to dress up in uh, modern poached ivory as antique and sell it and guess what no one's checking it costs about 500 pounds per item to carbon date something. No one's going to do that with a 200 pound antique that someone says is from 1922. No one's going to take it to the, in actual fact, a friend of mine alerted DEFRA authorities to the fact that they they suspected um, some modern ivory was being sold as antique ivory. And the, um, the DEFRA representative said, well, we don't know what to do about that. And that's that's the, in theory, the governing or the the, the regulatory body. Now, uh, the same can be said of, of of rhino horn. We all know that any legal trade, of any kind, gives a hiding place to the illegal trade, the black market. So it's an absolute no no. And 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 as I said, and as you've quite rightly said, Lauren, Lauren that there's all of that to one side. There's just morally, there's just no argument for it. There's just no place for that in this world anymore. It's a relic of brutal slaughter and no one should want it and uh you know it doesn't That's should even be discussed so we and we get to say that we don't have to we don't have to tiptoe around it no it's disgusting no. And by the way, i think it's just a really important thing to to add where lorian is pointing towards these letters let's not forget what we discussed on tuesday with peanut lamb from the david shepherd wildlife foundation where we discuss the fact that we have now seen the dismissal of the appeal raised by the antiques lobby trying to overturn the ban in uh, the ivory trade in, in, to include antiques meaning this works this kind of pressure petitions letters to cites letters to auction houses it works so please do jump over to uh, actionforrhinos.com 
you'll see at the top there's a section called downloads and this is where you'll find these two letters so this is one of those calls to action that we promise we'll always give you uh, it doesn't cost anything chuck a few letters towards CITES and tell your friends as well and ask them and this is where it gets really interesting is if we can reach out to those folks outside of our circle of animal advocates animal lovers who already would be doing this who who are willing to take action let's try and reach a little further afield and turn turn the tide in the favor of the rhinos and uh, and you you guys do that so beautifully with the education programs that you're running and um and thank you and and I'd like to say publicly so that you can hold me accountable for it that I want to get more involved in as a patron for, uh, of Action for Rhinos. I'd like to get mu much more involved in your uh, education programs and uh, you can mark my words, I will. Okay. Well, we've this is just step one. Uh, yay. But thank you, Dan. Uh, again, humbled and honoured to be able to chat and really with, cool. with, with, with all the, the guests if I can call them guests. Uh, you, you can, oh, you can, and, um, and they are guests. They're all here with us, and it's, uh, and it's wonderful that, um, that they are here, and as Adam says, so happy that that appeal was overturned. Let's, over, let's overturn, let's just keep this momentum going, because this is, we, you know, you, we, we talk about this a lot now in this, in this live broadcast environment because of the fact that we're doing this because we f feel like there's, a, there's an inroad. We have, a, we have some traction with the folks who wouldn't ordinarily listen because of the fact that everything that's happening is related to our relationship with animals. And, yeah. um, and I want to thank you, Lorian and, and Jane as well, uh, at the, being at the forefront with Action for Rhinos and doing the incredible work you do. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, 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 yeah, just one last little quote again. Please. Just the way yeah. is um, the great David Attenborough where he says the only way to save the rhino is to save the environment in which it lives because there's a mutual dependency between it and millions of other species of both animals and plants. And that to me it just accumulates that we're not bigger than, we're not bigger than the planet, we're not bigger than, yeah. but we can do good. We can, we can turn the tide. We, we, we can and I think it's so so important to remember that and I think that you guys uh, Jane and Lorian give us the you, you give us this room this constant reminder of what can be achieved with the, with the work that you're doing so we're, we're behind you all the way I want to thank you so much for sharing all of this with us and I mean what an incredible story that I know that so many of you guys know the story of of hope and to, to be talking to, to you as the literally the person who named her hope is just beautiful. And thank you, because it's such a profoundly moving and personal story. So I really appreciate you sharing that with us. Thank you. It's so I'm humbled and honored that you that you'd come onto this broadcast and do that. Thank you. Thank you. But it, it was there were many, many people that made it happen and work. And I just want to you know, conclude with, with, with hope. She unfortunately did pass in November 2016. Yeah. So she fought a battle of enormous... Uh, you, no one will ever understand what she went through, but mm. through what she did for us, we were able to move forward in research, in helping further rhinos along the way. So hope Thank something you. ever... She's listening to us. <laughs> I don't doubt it. I don't doubt it. She she is in many ways the uh, the rhino equi equivalent of Cecil the lion. Yes. In what yes. she did for the cause. Um, and so, guys, please get behind Action for Rhinos. I've just put on the screen that Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find them all under the same address, which is awesome. Action for Rhinos, as is the web address, actionforrhinos.com. And please follow them and share it with people so they also follow them because these guys are doing incredible work and effective work and all all we can do at this point if nothing else is just get those letters out to folks um, and ha have as many people as we can build on this momentum which Action for Rhinos have started for us so um, Lorian and Jane who I know you're 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 there watching um, because I can see your comments appearing Thank you both so much You're, to, to, to me and to all of the folks watching, you're, you're heroes. 
and we love you for everything that you do. Thank you. That's very kind. Thank you very much, Dan. Very much an appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Pleasure. You're very welcome. And uh, for the rest of you guys, um, just to let you know, on Saturday, I'm joined by Will Travers, the uh, president of the Born Free Foundation, uh, a dear friend of mine and uh, an amazing man who has literally dedicated the better part of his life to uh, the conservation and uh, he will be joining me to talk all things born free who we all know and love and uh, that will be seven o'clock on saturday so please join me then and um i can't wait to see you and uh one more huge thank you to lorian oh, no, and jane and and both wonderful thank you making an appearance superstar thank you kiki <laughs> and uh, all of you take care take great care of yourselves enjoy the sunshine don't forget to put sun cream on um and uh, we'll see you seven o'clock saturday thank you so much and good night